um, you know, it's a great honor to be asked to come back. Um, I spoke last year, and uh, it's great to see it growing, and, you know, it's all very exciting. So uh, this is, this is uh, going to be fun. So a quick, I don't really like these slides generally, but a quick bit about me. Um, I, I've been doing Go for a long time. Um, I wanted to build something on Google App Engine, and I had the choice of either Python or Java uh, or this weird little language Go, which was just beta and it was experimental and stuff, which and that appeals to me. So that's the one I picked. And since then, I've kind of stuck with it. Now I work at Gray Meta, and we're, our back end is 100% Go and kind of mi microservices and all that it's exciting stuff. Um, I've got a few other little, tiny little projects that are running on App Engine. Uh, which you can go and check out. And if anyone wants to see the code for that, I'm happy to share it. The only reason I don't is someone will find what's wrong with it, or they'll find a way to, to get in there, you know, almost certainly. Um, I also did Bitbar. No, I thought you were going to cheer. That's fine. Uh, uh, Bitbar is an app that lets you put... Uh, too, too late. Lets you put, um, the, uh, lets you put the output, standard out script, in the menu bar on a Mac. Uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, and the getbitbar.com site that goes with it is also Go and also App Engine. So, um, cool. Idiomatic Go tricks, then. Um, idiomatic is um, a basically things that are phrases that are uh, you know, natural to a native speaker. And I think it's possible to become a native speaker in Go. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share some of my favorite bits and pieces. Uh, some you might like, some you might not. Um, I'm interested to hear either way. So first of all, Go code. This is basically what Go code ends up looking like. You have uh, a few things that are distinct to Go, and, and a few style things that aren't really part of the spec, but they've kind of started to emerge. and. They've, they probably change over time, but they become, um, they become standard, and they kind of become idiomatic. And that's what I mean, really, when I talk about being a native Go speaker. So some examples, we don't have lots of lines, space gaps between the, the code. It all kind of sits together neatly. That's one of the, the features. We also have, obviously, multiple return arguments, which some, some languages have, some don't. The last return argument's usually an error. There's usually two, and the last one's an error. Um, and you can see here on the second line that get something call is, uh, is actually using those two arguments. And the error argument is called ERR. Uh, you know, again, it doesn't have to be, but that's become a kind of standard thing. Um, and a bit like what Dave Cheney was talking about in his Solid Go uh, talk, you know, Defer, defer is used because it's, it expresses very clearly what you're doing, and you expect something to close regardless uh, in this case. Um, some people think, well, that, that is a, there's a performance hit to that, and they'd rather have it, they'd rather just put it out uh, explicitly, and, um, you know, which is fine, but this makes it very clear what your intent is, and it makes that clear to new people that are going to come and, um, and use the code, and also to yourself. Uh, in the future. Your future self, um, I don't mean they're going to travel from the future and come and work and do like pair programming or anything like that, although it would be interesting. Um, I mean, you are going to forget this. When you look at it, you're sort of uh, not going to necessarily remember it in detail. And you're communicating to, your, to yourself as well as others. Um, yeah, so this is, this is what Go code ends up looking like. So there's one other feature um, that I, I like, and, and I tried to find a name for this, um, and I, I didn't find one. There might already be one. So I'm calling it line of sight. And essentially, we have a, a, a line down the left edge of, of, of code that tells you what that code um, is doing. And it's kind of the happy path sits down one edge, which is kind of strange. If you see in this first picture, you can, just by looking down the edge of the function, you can see what it's doing. It's going to get something, it's going to defer the closing. If something's not OK, deal with it. Something else, lock, unlock, defer. You know, you can read it down that edge. And then indented, if you look in the second picture, you have all the error handling. Um, and what this does is it allows you to quickly scan the function to see what it's doing. 
and it uh, lets you, it gives you, yeah, so the definition of uh, line of sight is a straight line along which an observer has unobstructed vision. And that's really what that is, if you think about it. Looking at a function, you just have, there's no obstructions, it's not complicated, you can, you can just see it. Uh, if we look at an example of code that has a bad line of sight, this is exactly the same, does the same thing as the previous example, but this time, it's kind of difficult to see what's going on. Um, we have, if something's okay, then we're gonna do this, and we sort of then nest inwards, and we're then carrying on. The return of this, the happy return, the thing that we're getting out of this is kind of lost in there, whereas before it was at the bottom. Um, and so it has a difficult, it's not a very clear line of sight to see what's happening. So some tips, um, make the happy return the last statement if possible. So when you look at a function, if you look at the bottom of the function, you kind of want to see what's being returned. And sometimes it's nice to go backwards from there to see, uh, to kind of investigate and learn about what that code is. Um, and next time you write else, consider flipping the logic. It's very natural to think if something's okay, then we're going to do this. That's how we think about it. But then you end up with nesting deep and uh, gets quite complicated. So if you think about, if you ever use else, see if you can flip it and get rid of the else altogether. If something's not okay, we're gonna deal with it. Because dealing with it usually is short and sweet. You're gonna get out of the function or something. And you can then protect that, the rest of that line of sight. Single method interfaces, I'm also a fan of the reader interface um, because of its, its power and its simplicity. And, uh, and, and you can do this too, and should, I think. So a, a single method interface is an interface consisting of only one method. And you know, they're, they're simple, they're really easy to use, and as, um, as Dave Cheney said, you, they, they, can be, they can come from anywhere. You, know, you, can, you can find them throughout the standard library. Um, and, and, and using it as, it, you know, it's really specific about what that function wants. And that's kind of uh, the, the key the key thing. Um, my other favorite is the handler interface, which is another great example. And this is, uh, has a serve HTTP, takes in a response writer and a request, and that's all you need to do in order to build something that's gonna handle uh, web requests, HTTP requests. Um, so you won't, so, you know, they become very easy to implement, these interfaces. If there were 10 methods, to, to, to implement in the, H, in the uh, HTTP handler interface, you're probably not gonna do it very often. If there's one, sure, it's easy. And you only need to build a struct with one method, it's awesome. But you can even you can go in a bit further than that, and uh, this is another um, kind of classic Go thing, which is, feels a bit weird initially, uh, but once you get your head around it, it turns out to be extremely useful. Um, handler func is a function type that has a method that implements the handler interface. So it's a function that has its own method on it, and when you call that method, it just calls itself, it just calls the function. But what that means is, you now no longer need the struct at all. You can just do a function. And you can use this pattern yourself. If you find, if you discover single method interfaces, Consider whether there's a, a use for just having a, a funk kind of alternative, funky alternative. No, that's not going to catch on. Okay, another one. This one's silly, but I use it every day. Um, sometimes I'm looking at logs that look like this, and it's just long, and, and I have to kind of find my way through it. Uh, and it's hard to see the function I'm working on. So I'm working on this function. I just want to log something and see it, but I've got all this other noise. So you can pop this at the top, log print line some dashes, defer printing the dashes, and that will just nicely bookend the output of a function for you. And, you, and then you can see it just clearly you know, shows you. The nice thing about deferring the, the, the slashes for the end is wherever your function exits, you're gonna get those lines. So it's, it's really nice. And they're at the top of the function, so you can comment them out, delete them easily enough. Um, so that's a little one there, which you can keep. Okay, teardown functions. This is very cool, I think. 
and we've used this quite a few times. Essentially, you have some function that does some work, and, and it's a great example is in, in testing, where you have some setup code. Um, and this might change a little bit with Go 1.7, but this principle applies. Um, I say that only because the, the testing, we now have um, subtests that you can that make that really easy, which is cool. Um, so here we have a setup function. It's going to create a sample file for us to use. And really, that file needs to be cleaned up after. We need to close it, close our connection to it, and also delete it. So what I'm doing here is I'm returning three arguments. I return the file itself. I'm returning a, func a function, and or optionally an error. Um, and then in the, in the body, I set that function up to do the teardown. And so what I can do when I call it, I immediately just defer the teardown and know that whatever's been set up inside this setup function is going to be cleaned up for me. And what's nice is if that setup does different things, that's OK. I don't, as a user of it, I don't need to worry about it because the cleanup is kind of part of it. And this is um, kind of about cohesion a little bit where these two things belong together. They're, they're both kind of um, they're, they're best friends, really. So it makes sense that they're next to each other. Um, cool. Another way to, to use kind of returning functions is in uh, timing. And we use this, this exact pattern. So we have a start timer function. And it creates, it captures the current time. It then returns a function to the calling code. And when that returned function is called, it takes the duration and prints out how long that function took to run. So you can see that you just you just call start timer, you keep the stop function, defer the stop function immediately, and that's then going to time how long that function took. So there's another little pattern of, of being able to, um, to use return functions. And it's worth thinking about um, because, you know, you, the calling code doesn't have to know about the time or doesn't have to worry about the state. It's all kind of captured in that closure, so, you know, we don't have to uh, trouble ourselves with it. Um, and it makes things easier for your users. And by users, I mean users of your code, which sometimes is you. So this goes a little bit to what um, the other talk was talking about, um, which I should stop referring to, of course, because it's gonna be, at some point this is going to be on, uh, on YouTube, which I've, I've, I shouldn't have said that either. Uh, so we have a, a sizer. <laughs> we have a sizer interface uh, here. And this is... Um, the idea is we want to get the size of something. And so, fine, we have a single method interface, which is nice. And I have a couple of functions of where we could use that. So there's a fits one where we pass in a capacity and the object and say, does this fit in this capacity? And we have also, is emailable? So this is, you know, can I email this uh, item? And it's going to make that decision based on its size. And then there's a sample implementation there on, on this file type that has a size which gets it from the info. So you can see that it's quite easy to implement this interface. So then you can do something quite clever, which is you can create a new type, which is a slice of that interface, and make that type implement the same interface. So now you can treat many items as one, and you can use them in the same place as you use the, the size so it goes into the fits method, no problem. So we could have 10 files and pass that in. And the fits method doesn't have to know that's what you're doing. Um, the implementation here just iterates over the, the objects, calls size, and totals it up. You know? So we just get the sum of all the, the size there. So that's quite cool. Other ways to implement the interface include, of course, the size func. So we could have now a function ad hoc calculates the size of something. And we can pass that in to anything that's using this size interface. Um, and similarly, you can just do it the, the type itself. So here I have uh, the type size, it's an int 64. That then implements the size interface, which just returns itself. Um, so now I can, just, I can just, wherever I need to pass a size, I don't need to create an object. I can just pass in, I can just cast it and say, size, this size. And it's the reason it's easy to do all these different things with this interface is because it's so small, a single method. So see if you can find single method interfaces when, you, when you're thinking about building your, 
bits and pieces. Okay, optional features. This one turns out to be really quite powerful. You, here is a, they have this decode function at the bottom, and the idea is I'm going to pass in a, a, a reader, probably you know, a, uh, something from the HTTP request, and it's going to decode the JSON for me. But optionally, it's also going to call valid, call this, this valid method. Actually, the method's called OK. It's going to call that on the object if it has it. And the way we do that here is we just have, we, we do a uh, type assertion. So we say, if, if this object implements the valid interface, which is another single method interface, by the way, then, uh, then call it. And if that OK method returns an error, then we know that the object isn't OK. So this is a great way to do validation on objects. And also, keep the, keep the validation of an object with the object, rather than repeating it or, um, or you know, having it uh, some other place or some other system. So that's a nice one. And you can do that for, for many different things. So whenever you think, you know, we have this, we have this kind of thing, and sometimes it has, it doesn't, it's not quite always like this. Sometimes it also has these extra bits and pieces. So then consider maybe there's, maybe there's two interfaces, or maybe it's, you know, worth abstracting a little bit. I've no idea how much time I have, but I'm going to just plow on. Thumbs up. Uh, cool. Simple mocks. Okay. So here we have a, uh, an interface called mail sender, and it has two methods, I'm afraid. And it has send and send from. And so this is, this is a nice little trick of, of creating something that you can use in testing. So you just make a, uh, a struct that has fields for each method. So because you know, the function's uh, just a type, really, um, you, can, you have a, a send func and a, a send from func. So these two uh, fields can then be set at uh, you know, when you write your test. And then all we do is implement the interface that just calls those functions. So you don't have to, you don't have to build complicated mock objects. What we can do in test code is just create the, the, this mock version and pass it into our code that we're testing. And we can control in the test what that function is going to do. So that could involve capturing, the, capturing what was called and making assertions about it, which is often quite useful. And you can also control what's returned. Um, you know, and in, in this case, in the send from func, I'm returning an error. Another nice thing is you don't have to implement every field. You can, only, you can just focus on the one that you want to test. If other fields are called, you're going to get some kind of nil panic, probably. But you know, that means then that something's happening that you haven't expected in your test code, so you have to then address it anyway. So it sort of kind of sorts itself out. Mocking other people's structs. Okay. Um, so sometimes the, some package has this struct, and you wish it was an interface. Has that ever happened to anyone? Def I heard someone over there say, "Yes, Matt, definitely yes." Well, it, ha it has happened to me, and what happens is you you've immediately feel like um, this is. I wish they'd done an interface, and you're thinking maybe I'll do a pull request to the, and abstract this and things. Uh, or you might think, I just want to take a sword and slowly pass it through myself. Because that's how it feels. It's like, that's, this is terrible. But don't despair, because you can make your own interface. You already know what the methods are that you're, that you're going to be working with. So you can just make your own. And since there's no explicit uh, implementing interfaces in Go, it's a sort of duct typing. It's called structural typing. Um, you don't, they don't even have to know that you've done this. So in, this, in their package, their messenger, we create our own messenger interface here that implements the same method, and we can then use that. Now, their struct already implements this, so our code's going to work as before, but now we can create our own Mark 1 or uh, do whatever we want since it's now an interface. So that's another cool one that's uh, worth remembering. Retrying. This is nice. Um, essentially, you know, sometimes you want to call a function a couple of times. You don't want to have to um, build. You don't want third-party frameworks and things to do to solve this for you. Um, so 
you, you can do something like this. This is the, the try code, it's a try function, and essentially it's just gonna call it, and then it expects a bool a, a, or an error, and if the bool is true, uh, it'll continue. If it's false, it stops, and, you know, and if there's an error, it returns that. Um, this, that's it in its entirety. You can get the full code at um, github.com slash mattryan slash try, but don't import that package. Copy the function, because it's tiny and there's no need to build in a dependency to that. Um, but how you can use it is you just, you just uh, you call try, you pass in a function. The function gives you um, the, the attempt number, which starts at uh, zero or one, I can't remember. Um, and then you can just return where attempt is less than five, so that's gonna be true up until it's five, at which point it stops, and that, you know, it's gonna stop retrying. So it's quite nice, it's quite easy to read. I think it's obvious. If I showed you this and said, What's this, what does this do? I think you'd it'd be obvious, you'd know. And that's kind of, uh, kind of key. And then so, if you wanna do a delay between the retries, which you might wanna do, one option you have is to add a function to the try uh, package or whatever that is. You could add a function to say try delay and you pass in a delay, uh, a duration. Um, so yeah, you could do that. But if, if there's a way to not change anything and still solve that problem in user space, then that's got to be preferable because it keeps, your, it keeps that try interface dead simple. Um, so that's, as a principle, I think, worth always seeking. And in this case, it's quite easy. We just check if the error's not nil, just sleep. So it does it in the body. That also means it's in the place where it's ha actually happening, and that's where you, that's where you see it. So um, I think that's a nice, another nice little pattern. Another one, empty struct implementations. Sometimes you have an interface like codec, and uh, you want to implement that codec. We well, can do it like this with an empty struct that essentially is just a collection of these, the methods that implement that interface. Since there's no state in here, there's no need for it to be anything more complicated. And you can see that the receiver, the JSON codec here, the receiver actually uh, doesn't, we don't capture it. It's ju it just says the type. And that also makes it clear that we're not going to use, that we're not going to store any state. Uh, so it's an another nice thing to do. And then at the bottom, we, have the, uh, we just have this, this var here called JSON, which is of type codec, by the way, and it's just a, 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 an implementation of that empty struct. So what's nice about this is if this was a package, all, we've, all we have to expose is the codec interface and the JSON variable. So it's, it's dead clear that what's going on. We don't have to have JSON codec exposed as well. That's why it starts with the lowercase j, keeping it private. Um, and the other nice thing is, you, you know, wherever you need to, if you, if you want to just use the JSON stuff directly, you can, if, and this was in a package, it might be, you know, encoding dot JSON, the variable, dot encode. And you can actually access directly those methods. Semaphores. We want to have, we've got this process going, we want to limit the number of Go routines that are running at once, okay? Well, this is a really nice, simple way of doing that. Essentially, the idea is you create a buffered channel, and the size of the channel is how many concurrent Go routines you want. And what you do before you do the work, you send in something into that channel. And the, you know, while there's room in that channel, that's going to go through no problem. As soon as that channel's full, it can't, it'll block. It can't put any more in. And then you spin up another Go routine here where you defer the function of reading from that, that semaphore channel. And that then clears one of the slots, which then would unblock one of the others. Uh, and I, I, can, I can show you this running. You can actually see that it, I set the limit to five, and you can see that these things are running in blocks of five. There are only five Go routines running at a time. So it's a nice way to kind of control things and, and you know, make sure things don't go crazy. Debug logs with, build, with a build tag. Um, I like this. I'm sure someone will tell me on one of the websites or not, this is perhaps not a good idea. Um, always always love, love that. I actually do, because the, the learning's awesome. 
So the idea is uh, we, we set a, a variable called verbose to false, and then we, we use that variable whenever we're going to debug something. And of course, it's just false all the time, so it's silent. But then in a different file, you put a build tag of debug in, and just in the init, just set that verbose value to true, and that then turns on uh, the verbose logging. So you can do that in a build tag. So then you could run tests with this flag and uh, use the, the, uh, the, the build the uh, tags, and it will turn on. You can also do it in production if you want for building and stuff. You know, I think on bigger systems, you're going to have slightly more sophisticated logging and stuff like that, but for small programs, this is it's really great. So definitely be obvious, not clever. Um, one example, from before, the, the start timer example. This is another way to write it, where you defer start timer, you call the function, you know that returns the stop function, if you remember, which you then call, but it's deferred. So what will happen is the start timer thing will be called now, and then the stop what, is confusing. So even though this, is, this takes two lines to say, it's way clearer. Um, and I think you know, it, that, that's worth going for. It's not, it's not all about trying to be really clever. And, and smart, um, it's smarter to be simple. So how to become a native speaker in Go if you want to? Well, read the standard library. There are lots of great examples of things to learn in there, and there's lots of, uh, lots of cool stuff, and it's all open source. You can just go and read it. Write obvious code, not clever code. Don't surprise, you, you know, don't surprise your users. Don't do something. Don't do extra checks just to be clever, just to be really, you know, to make sure it's bulletproof. Um, just make it really obvious and, and, and simple. Seek simplicity. Um, and, and definitely participate in open source projects, because I've learned most, a lot of these, I, I've, we've kind of worked with, with the team and come up with together, but a lot of them also um, I've, I've found in open source projects when I've seen and working with people. Ask for reviews and accept criticisms, and if you spot something in someone else's code, by all means, you know, point it out. And be kind when you do that, because people are very personal about their code. So be gentle, but share ideas. And, and uh, if you've got any questions about any of this stuff, please tweet me at Matt Raya. Um, I'm nearing 1,000 followers, and that would be awesome if we could get 1,000 followers. Uh, my, dad, my dad said, you'll never get 1,000 followers on Twitter. And I said, Dad, get out. Get out. Thank you very much.